Hey, my name is Jim Bernal. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the founder and CEO of Willamette Valley Vineyards. Uh, started, actually found this land back in, in uh, 1981 and um, was, uh, began planting it in 1980, clearing it and planting it in 1983. Um, this presentation is about our preferred stock offering. And we have, uh, we started a preferred stock offering in uh, July of $10.7 million preferred stock offering. We have about $2.3 million uh, worth of shares remaining in the offering. Um, and the uh, present stock price for the shares is $5.15 a share. Uh, it'll go up at the end of this month to $5.25 a share. It presently yields a, a return of about 4.27% in a dividend, which is $0.22 cents a share. Uh, we have had a lot of success in, in using this approach in finding wine enthusiasts who want to own their own winery. And uh, that has been a source of great strength in growing our company. Now, for those of you who have questions, there is, a, uh, I'm told, a place at the bottom of the screen where you can, it's a Q&A, where you're able to type in your questions. And I have a very able staff here. Uh, Dana Fritsch, uh, who's the administrative manager, is helping me. She, she will help answer these questions, as will several of the other staff members that are helping. It uh, looks like we've already got a question uh, uh, that's uh, on the screen. And I also have Carol Astley from marketing here helping me and actually helped me put this slide presentation together, which I greatly appreciate. Katie Gill is our ownership services leader. She's actually helping as well. And then I think Eric Fritt, uh, Witt, I'm sorry, Eric Witt from our uh, IT department is here to make sure if everything goes sideways, we've got somebody to help us put it back together again uh, for this presentation. So that's what I have to, to begin. We're about five minutes in, and hopefully we've got everybody now uh, that's going to be on this Zoom with us so that I can begin. Now, for those of you who have, um, uh, you know, received the information about this uh, preferred offering, you know that we're doing something that's unusual. You probably haven't seen it before when you bought uh, preferred stock, and that is um, there's actually an ownership application. And the reason why we have that is because uh, there's a lot of people obviously that want to own these shares. We're interested in having those owners who will help grow the value of their investment. And those are wine enthusiasts who will enjoy the wines, uh, tell their friends and family members and uh, colleagues about the quality of Oregon wine and will participate in programs that support the winery, like our wine club. And so that's uh, actually a first for the US Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, to allow us to actually qualify um, those who are making uh, applications for subscription for preferred stock uh, for us to make sure that we have owners that really help grow the value of the business. In addition, there's a lot of material that you can read about the company. We provide a prospectus, um, a 8Ks, 10Qs, 10Ks, um, so that you can read about um, you know, the success we've had, the, uh, our financial performance over the years, as you can know, of course, I've been doing this for what now almost 40 years. Um, and, and you can also read about the risks. Remember, this is preferred stock. It's a preferred stock in a winery. Obviously, we've gone through a lot of growing pains over the years. I'm sure we will have them in the future. And you need to learn about the agricultural risks um, that we take in growing our grapes and making our wine and all the host of business risks uh, that we face so that you can determine if this is an investment that's suitable for you. Uh, here is just an example of some of our staff and our owners enjoying themselves in the cellar. And I think that's a big part of why we have so many wine enthusiasts as owners is because they really enjoy being an owner, being on the inside of the winery, learning about uh, our industry and winemaking and enjoying their ownership in the winery. You know, we, we actually did the very first, um, what you'd call community funded or crowd funded uh, business in America. I did the very first, uh, what's called regulation A, uh, self underwritten stock offering back in 1989. And we were a little, we like the poster child of uh, raising funds for what people called unqualified investors. Unqualified investors, the government called people that made less than $250,000 a year 
and had less than $2 million in assets, not including their home or furnishings or automobiles. And so those are a very narrow group of people that they allowed people like myself, entrepreneurs to raise capital in this way. But there have been changes to the law that allowed for small amounts of stock to be sold and raised. And now there's a whole fabric of federal and state laws that allow um, businesses, smaller business to have access to investors who are quote unquote, not qualified um, or rather very wealthy. Um, and so that is really how we've benefited uh, uh, from wine enthusiast ownership from people from all walks of life uh, to grow our business. Now as owners, of course, you, you, you get not only to be on the inside and benefit from the, the, the ownership in terms of the growth of the industry, the growth of the winery, but you also get something nobody else gets. And that is you get to buy your wines for 25% off down to bottle one. You get invited to special ownership um, um, events. Uh, you get treated, uh, of course, in a, in a special way at the winery. There, there are times of the year when we do provide preferred seating for advanced uh, reservation. And then you get to convert your dividend for 15% more in value to use it for anything you want to buy from the winery, including the wonderful food that um, our chefs prepare. Um, so anyway, those are just some of the things that um, that uh, you get to have as owners. You know, I had years ago, one of our shareholders tell me that Jimmy said, Jim, this is the only stock I own where I can drink myself to profitability. And, um, and, and he said that in kind of a joking way, but it's really true. It's, it's really what has enabled our, our winery to grow. But I, this next slide I wanna show you uh, is a lot of numbers, but, I, but it, you actually probably haven't seen a slide like this before if you have any, uh, reading of the wine industry to learn um, how the Oregon wine industry is doing in the nation. So this uh, information is from Nielsen, which gathers scan data from the cash registers of all the chain stores in the United States that contribute data to the Nielsen. And this is how they track the sale of various products that scan through the cash registers. And this is wine, and you can see that this is wine produced in the United States in the upper part of the slide, wine produced uh, outside the United States from various countries in the lower part. And you can see the dollar values of what's scanned through the registers in the United States over the last 52 weeks. And you look carefully, you can see that, oh my gosh, consumers across the country are preferring Oregon wine. And you can see a growth rate of 9.4%. Look at that, as compared to any other region of the country or the world. You know, the other thing that's really surprising is that the average price of wine scanned through the registers of Oregon wine is $17. The average price of a Washington wine scanned through the registers is 10. And for California, North Carolina, New York, and Texas, the average price averages around $8 a bottle. So think of that. We're the fastest growing, and we actually are the most uh, expensive on average that are scanning through the registers. That tells you that there's something going on with Oregon wine. Now this next slide you'll see, you probably have never seen something like this before. This shows you by state uh, the, the winery concentrations per capita. Look at that, look at Oregon. We lead the nation in the number of wineries per capita. You know, when I first started, there was only a handful of us in Oregon making wine, growing grapes. And now there's over a thousand bonded wineries in Oregon. It's amazing. Uh, yet many of them are small and most of their wine they sell directly out of their tasting room, uh, tasting rooms. But it just gives you an idea of, of really the unique opportunity we have to grow inside the state of Oregon and to tell the story of Oregon wines across the nation. Now, one of the reasons why we're doing so well is this. This next slide shows you that Oregon wine is on the rise. You know, Oregon producers, we only make about 1% of the wine that's made in the United States by volume, only about 1%. Most of that wine's made in California. Now here, you can see on the right hand of your screen that Oregon wineries have earned 18% of Wine Spectator Magazine's scores of 90 plus, 90 plus, 90 or, plus or above. 
of all uh, US wines rated during this time period. And so how about that? So there's a reason why Oregon wines are being chosen by consumers. This is one of them. And part of the reason why Oregon wines rate so well is because Oregon has the highest standards in the nation in controlling uh, wine content by variety, uh, by vintage, by um, uh, American viticultural area. Uh, so that's part of the reason why uh, we are doing so well. High standards enforced by law. Um, this next slide is um, uh, Oregon. A lot of people uh, don't realize that the Willamette Valley is the size of the state of Connecticut. You know, people have traveled to Napa, Sonoma, or even to Burgundy or Champagne or Bordeaux in France. Those are fairly small growing regions, but compared to the Willamette Valley, you know, in Burgundy, you can't really find another place to plant grapes, except if you take the houses out at the bottom of the hill. Um, so here in the Willamette Valley, there's a great future for us. These are the image, these names that you see in this slide are our vineyards, the vineyards our shareholders own. And as you know, as preferred stockholders, preferred means you have a preferred position in ownership. So your ownership is a preferred or ahead of common stockholders. We have both preferred and common stockholders. And, and, and so you can see the estate vineyard where I'm speaking from, but also these other vineyards in the Willamette Valley and also over in the Walla Walla where we have several vineyards uh, in the Walla Walla Valley, but on the Oregon side. This is a slide that shows you, of course, where our sparkling uh, winery is being built. Uh, that will, um, it's located just off of Highway 99 called Domain Willamette. Uh, we expect to be open uh, mid-year in June. And this also shows you our plan for a new expansion winery site. And that's because we're actually grown to the point now where we're at capacity at the uh, Salem Hills Winery that's up on the hill. We really can't grow any further. Um, uh, there's just no room. And so this site is a 40 acre site where we're gonna build a state of the art uh, expansion winery. You know, one of the things I just wanted to mention to you is not only do you own these wineries and these vineyards, but I just want to give you an idea just how much you own. Uh, we, we own 705 acres of vineyard land. Um, not all of that is producing yet, it's not all planted. And then we lease another 315 acres. So we farm over 1,000 acres of grapevines. Uh, just to give you an idea of the scale of our operation from when we just started. This slide that I just am showing you just passed is like all of those over 90 plus point scores. But these slides I wanted to show you, these are exclusive, owner exclusive wines that we make. That's one of the reasons why people want to be an owner of the winery, because they have the right to obtain wines that nobody else can obtain. Uh, your delicious uh, signature cuvee Pinot Noir our uh, method traditional uh, brute, which is made uh, by the um, uh, wines developing through secondary fermentation in the bottle. Um, what's been called method champenoise or how the uh, wines are made traditionally in Champagne. And then of course, uh, this special Griffin Creek, uh, uh, the Griffin, which is our red blend and our most exclusive uh, highest quality uh, Griffin Creek wine from Southern Oregon. Now I wanted to, you to take a look at this, um, this slide just for a little bit. Say, so, I haven't ever shown this slide to you before. And I know we have a few uh, people who uh, are tuned in that have seen this presentation that I gave last quarter. But I wanted to show you some of the details of why our strategy is so unique and so powerful. When you have owners who are wine enthusiasts, what does that mean? So on this slide, you can see in 2000, uh, this is 2020 uh, data um, and total annualized data. And uh, you can see the sales, what they were, our total retail sales were almost 11 million. That's wine that we sell directly out of our tasting rooms or um, you know, the internet and we ship to people. Uh, there you can see that 31% of the entire spend, retail spend were our owners. And then you can see 
a uh, little bit of the math of what does that mean? So that means about three, a little over $3.3 million of wine was purchased by our owners. So then you subtract the cost of growing it and making the wine. Um, and that's, you know, the farming and the, you know, the wine making and the bottles and the labels and the corks and the capsules. You subtract that out of that number. And then you subtract out the sales commissions that our ambassadors would earn in selling that wine. And so you can see what you end up with. And, and that's, that's your gross kind of gross profit or kind of adjusted gross profit number. And then you subtract out the dividends, the cash dividends we pay to the preferred stockholders that have joined us as preferred owners since 2015. And then you can see what's left over. How about that? So that's what happens when your owners buy wine from their winery. Because of the, what they're paying, even though it's a discounted price and a very favorable price, there's still a margin in there. And that margin then continues to grow the business. How about that? So that is why our strategy is so powerful, is that our owners are one of the engines that make our winery successful. And, and you can see over here on the right, the growth of our owner's purchases over the years. There's 2016 rising to the year 2020. So when the government shut down the tasting rooms, actually shut down the restaurants um, to control um, the spread of the virus, um, they, they, we lost 48% of our market. Yet our owners bought a lot of wine directly from the winery that we shipped them. And which was one of the reasons why we had one of the best, actually, we had the best financial year in our history in 2020. Uh, this is uh, just something that's, it, that we also sell our wine, of course, as you know, around the country in restaurants predominantly and in retail stores, retail shops, and grocery stores. And here, uh, Schenken News, which owns the Wine Spectator, named Willamette Valley Vineyards as a hot prospect. In other words, one of the high performers in the, in, in the industry nationwide as a category leader. And so you can see why, one of the reasons why they did. Here's our numbers. This is our, our sales uh, that, that we earned uh, by selling our wines to distributors. So you can see 2019, it rose from 14, a little over 14 million to 2000, year 2021. Just January through November is 18 million. And these are case depletions. What case depletions means is that these are wines that we've sold to our distributor and have depleted from their warehouses to their customers, to restaurants and grocery stores. And you can see the rise from 99,000 cases to 100, almost 112,000, now a little over 127,000 cases just from January to October, comparing those numbers. And those are sales from our wholesalers to their customers. So we're doing extremely well, despite the challenges that wineries have had this last two years. Now, one of the things that you know about is you know about the wine industry facing challenges on the West Coast from forest fires. And we had a significant events. So I wanted to show you this slide in the year 2020 about what happened in the Willamette Valley. This is one of the questions that I got in the Q&A um, that, that came to me before uh, this presentation. They said, Jim, tell us a little bit about what happened with all that smoke. And you know, when you, for those of you who follow Napa and Sonoma, they've been plagued by fires for some time and it's been greatly affecting the, the fruit. But here in the Willamette Valley, we've kind of been lucky. We've just been very lucky. Up until 2020, when the Willamette Valley uh, received um, the smoke from the Beachy Fire and the Lions had fire, but principally the Beachy Fire that came blowing from the east to the west. So this slide is broken into four quadrants. So here you can see on the top left, that's the estate where I'm at now. That's what the conditions were. This is all, by the way, on the same day in September, these pictures were taken. On the far, on the top right, that is the vineyard at Bernal Estate up near Dundee. So you can see the smoke, but the smoke is way up in the sky, not down by the fruit. And then down on the lower left, you can see this is the Elton Vineyard. This is in the Yola Amity Hills ABA, in the, Am in the Yola Hills. And you can see the smoke from the Beachy Fire blowing from the fire on the east over coming west, but it actually turns and goes south. 
And so you can see the smoke did not reach those vines at Elton Vineyard uh, at this time. And then at Tualatin Vineyard, which is our largest uh, contiguous planting, uh, is uh, located up near Forest Grove, north of Forest Grove. And there you can see that there was no smoke at all. And so a lot of people, when they read about the 2020 smoke in the Willamette Valley and its effect on the industry, they didn't realize that it was very spotty. And, and in fact, there's a lot of California wineries that buy Oregon fruit that cancel their contracts because they were fearful of the effect of smoke. But, and so we were beneficiaries really of that because many of those growers came to us after their contracts were canceled and we received their, their fruit. Uh, so we bought a lot of fruit um, that we previously hadn't contracted for. And it turned out to be a blessing, both for the grower uh, that didn't have adversely affected fruit. In fact, the fruit was really good because the yields were really low. The yields were the lowest in Oregon history. The yields were 38% lower than the average yield because it, Mother Nature rained on the vines during bloom. And when the rain drops hit the flowering, those little flowers, they don't pollinate and they don't form a berry. And so that naturally takes the, the yield down. And so the vines had a lot less fruit to focus on in ripening. So this, you'll find the 2020 uh, wines from the Willamette Valley are gonna be excellent because of those low yields. So I just wanted to kind of share that with you um, and let you know that, um, that, that that you go out and you look at the wines uh, that have been reviewed by the Wine Spectator, Wine Enthusiast, and other publications, uh, you'll find those 2020 wines from the Willamette Valley from Squirtery High, including all of our, our the core wines that we sell that are out in the trade, uh, have been rated over 90 points. This is just a slide to show you our commitment to sustainable farming and to being um, a really good neighbor. Um, be careful with how we farm uh, and um, making sure that we're respectful of our neighbors, uh, respectful of all life, and producing a product that's healthy uh, and, and including for the wildlife and for the fish. And so you see the symbol down there, Salmon Safe. That's a Pacific Rivers Council designation, which means that the groundwater is safe. And the farming practices are, are safe. Uh, you see the uh, FSC certification, that's the Forest Stewardship Council certification. That's because we use natural cork that's certified to their strict standards. There's the Rainforest Alliance certification, which is partnered with FSC um, because we use natural cork. It's grown under uh, proper conditions of growing the cork. And there's the live certification, low input viticulture and analogy. That's a, the number one uh, sustainable uh, farming certification program for vineyards in Oregon, vineyards and wineries. And I'm proud to say that, that we are founders of that organization. Um, so you can take confidence in us being very careful with how we farm. And, um, uh, and we'll, we've always done that, we do that. And, and at uh, Bernal Estate Vineyard, uh, where we're building our sparkling winery, that's biodynamically farmed, and we will earn a Demeter certification for growing under the, the very strict biodynamic standards. And I can't wait to be able to show you that in person. And then you can see, of course, this uh, uh, these windmills here. We we do generate um, our energy through our solar panels on our on our roofs, as well as by wind power from PGE. Uh, this slide is just a. Uh, to show you something that we're doing um, that, that we think is really important, not just for ourselves, but for all of agriculture. You know, the number one problem in agriculture is powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is the biggest problem we face as farmers in growing various fruits. And, um, and, and what happens is uh, farmers generally have to rely upon fungicides to uh, control and stop powdery mildew from damaging their fruit. The problem with fungicides is that they can end up, you know, on the ground or end up in you. And, and so we don't want to do that. And so we use organic sulfur, uh, which, you know, is, which is we're allowed to use under our certification, our live standards. Um, but even so, 
uh, organic sulfur can still end up in, in the ground. And, and so we learned about UVC light and the power of UVC light. And there, there's a fellow, a uh, professor at, um, uh, at Cornell University, Dr. David DeGordi, and he has been studying UVC light and its ability to, to control and to kill powdery mildew. And it's been a fairly recent discovery that if you apply UVC light at night, when the powdery mildew has its repair mechanism turned off, you can actually, you can actually kill it. And so this is the very first autonomous robot, UVC light robot in the world. Uh, we, we bought this uh, experimental um, robot from uh, an inventor in Norway. And, uh, and we're applying UVC light working in partnership with the USDA and Oregon State University uh, to, uh, to prove this technology. Because if we can use this light at night, and kill powdery mildew without, while we're sleeping in this autonomous robot following a GPS pattern through the vineyard, uh, then we can eliminate and teach farmers how to eliminate the use of harmful chemicals in controlling um, powdery mildew. This is a picture of uh, Bill Fuller on the left, um, Efren Loeza on the right. Uh, they worked at Tualatin uh, the state vineyards, as you know, Bill Fuller founded that vineyard, one of the first uh, founding winemakers to come to Oregon from California. He's now 83 years old. He's still making wine in our cellar. I was the lucky person that he called when he said he wanted to retire. And so we merged our businesses together. And it's one of the great things that have happened to our company. And he still makes wine. And there's wine that we make uh, here in the cellar. Uh, the vintage series that he personally supervises. And Efren Loeza was one of his first employees. Efren is our vineyard manager, and Efren is toasting the planting at the Loeza Vineyard. It's named in his honor. So this is an image of Tualatin. I know some of you have been up there. Uh, Tualatin, Vine Tualatin Estate Vineyard is uh, you know, near Banks. Um, it's planted, one of the very first plantings of, of uh, uh, Pinot Noir in the Willamette Valley, planted in 1973. And we've grown the vineyard since then. Uh, you just got to see it, just gorgeous. And it's got a, the taste rooms there that Bill Fuller built, still there, and, and people really enjoy it. Very unique uh, growing conditions. You can see this ridge there, that's the coast range. So there's kind of a coast range cul-de-sac that protects this vineyard from the marine weather as you get into the fall, which is one of the reasons why it's so extraordinary. This is an image of Loeza Vineyard. This is near Gaston. This is actually just east of Gaston, named in honor of our vineyard manager and his family who helped had farmed this land for years. And um, you can see in this image, uh, in the middle of the screen, you can see a pond, and then you see a big white apron. Well, what we wanted to do was we wanted to farm sustainably without drawing water out of the ground, without taking water out of the river when the fish need it. So we built basically a very large catchment pond. So we collect rainwater during the winter when the rainwater is wasted, it just goes out into the Pacific. Well, we catch that rainwater during the winter. And that's enough water to drip, drip irrigate these vines via gravity um, uh, during the summer. So that's a way that we're teaching other farmers now how they can do that. How can we grow, use water um, very sustainably? This is an image of, uh, there's Dick and Betty O'Brien, founders of Elton Vineyard. Uh, we, uh, Betty actually served on our board of directors uh, for many years. She's now retired uh, from our board and lives on the property. She lost Dick uh, some years ago, but they founded this vineyard and we were the very fortunate people that have the privilege of farming it now um, you know, on a lease basis. And we now negotiated a, an ability to now purchase this vineyard, uh, allowing us to continue to make investments in this vineyard. Uh, so in time, we will own this vineyard. And then you'll see here, then in, in kind of a white rock, kind of the lower part of the vineyard. I wanna show you that next. 
it's, it's one of the pieces of the story that's so extraordinary about uh, vineyards grown in the Willamette Valley. That is a glacial erratic that Dick uh, O'Brien is standing in front of. And that rock was, was ferried into the Willamette Valley some 16 to 14,000 years ago in the great Missoula Lake flood. One of the greatest floods that, that the geologists have been able to determine on the planet. And, um, and that is what helped shape the growing conditions, uh, soil conditions uh, of the Willamette Valley depositing all that topsoil that was scraped off in this great flood from eastern Washington, brought it down the Columbia River, backed up into the Willamette River, and deposited all those soils on our slopes, and including what they call glacial erratics, granite from Canada. It's a pretty amazing story. This is an image in the foreground. You can see Elton Vineyard in a uh, there, but you can also in the foreground see the new Ingram Vineyard. Uh, we were able to purchase a land from Alan Ingram, that's Betty's brother, and we now own this property. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very large planting of Pinot Noir. And then we leased property from him as well. So it's a, quite a large planting uh, there in the Yola Hills. Uh, probably, probably, I think it's the largest uh, contiguous planting of Pinot Noir. Uh, in the Willamette Valley. Here you can see an, uh, the architect's rendering of the sparkling winery where it's under construction. My wife, Jan, is leading that construction effort. Um, and uh, this is um, this will be available for you to see in hopefully in June. We'll have a special event for you uh, before we open it up to the public. And these are these biodynamically armed gardens, uh, as well as the vineyard that will be here. And there's, you can see the, um, the cave there that will hold our, um, our sparkling wine. It will be aging. Be quite a facility for you to enjoy. We believe um, in a remarkable place in which to tell the story, not just of our wines that are grown in the Willamette Valley, but also the, the um, the unique attributes that in the North we have, North Willamette we have for growing Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Pinot Meunier. The, the climate is such that it develops flavors and aromas in the fruit at lower sugar levels. And that's what you pick to make sparkling wine is lower bricks levels or sugar levels. And so in time, we believe that uh, North Willamette um, sparkling wine will become equal uh, and on equal footing to the highest quality champagnes from France. This is just an image to show you a little bit about where we are. We, we needed to get help from the Department of Transportation to widen Highway 99, which we did. So if you're driving past there, you can see a new middle lane and a turn lane into our property. We've converted this small winery that was down uh, fronting Highway 99. That'll be converted into the Domain Willamette uh, wine shop. And this is just an image of uh, what's going on there underground in making those uh, sparkling wine caves. This is an image to show you something we've done uh, of an outpost strategy. What we, we wanted to do is to take the Oregon story on the road. We wanted to show people um, around, you know, where they lived about the quality of Oregon wine. And so this is a tasting room uh, that we built in uh, near Sacramento, California, Folsom in the historic district called Willamette Wine Works. And um, yeah, we opened it two weeks before uh, the pandemic hit. And of course now is now just being able to be uh, utilized really to the extent that it, of it was designed uh, by wine enthusiasts. But this, uh, this outpost strategy has now developed into something quite serious. So this is what is, this is a architect's rendering of what is under construction in Lake Oswego, where we're going to build a full scale restaurant and tasting room. Um, and then uh, we're also doing the same thing in Vancouver on the Vancouver waterfront. This is actually uh, going to be built uh, right above the Mary Hill uh, tasting and bistro on the Vancouver waterfront. And we're also gonna be building one in Happy Valley and also in Bend. 
And so this is part of our way that we're going to grow the company. And that's why these preferred owners are so valuable because these preferred owners live in these communities. We actually sell stock to preferred owners in these communities. And um, um, the, this is a way in which they can enjoy their wines and bring their friends, but, and, and also a way for us to project uh, the storytelling and the sale of our wines into these communities. One of the things that we're doing, like one of the tools we used to tell that story was we created this very unique barrel blending system that we installed in the uh, Willamette Wine Works in Folsom, California. It's actually like a micro winery. Uh, and here's where you come. If you come to, to the winery here at the estate, you'll be able to come into the Roth barrel room uh, named after Orville Roth in his honor of Ross Fresh Markets here in the Mid Valley. This is a system that allows wine enthusiasts to come and learn about the different natural clones of Pinot Noir and taste each one of them and then create their own blends. Now this has been done by wineries where they do barrel blending, but the big problem is whenever you take a bung off of the top of a barrel, the air is introduced into the barrel and then you thieve the, the wine out of the, the barrel and then you can get bacteria and even other things into the barrel. Um, and so doing wine barrel tastings um, it is really discouraged by winemakers because they're worried about the wine being adversely affected that's in the barrel. And so what we did was we designed a system um, where these wines are in the closed system. So these are these different clones of Pinot Noir. They're in a closed system. And then you use these dials here to be able to dial the particular percentages of each clone that you want to blend together without uh, these barrels being exposed to oxygen or anything else. So this is a, a there's nothing like it in the world. And we actually are going to be filing uh, for a patent uh, on this system. Uh, this system is, this particular system is designed by David Markell, who retired out of Hewlett Packard. He's one of our shareholders and he's the director of uh, research and development here in Hawaii now. Very lucky to have him. This is just an image of one of the services that we're preparing um, to open uh, this next year. This is what we call Into the Woods. This is a place where our owners and, uh, can obtain priority use of. Um, this is a place for them to bring their big RVs. Uh, we have owners who like to visit the winery, bring their RVs, leave them plugged in for their pets that are in the RVs, and then be able to enjoy the winery and then stay overnight at the winery. And uh, so this will be available for um, this next uh, growing, this next uh, tourist season. Um, we're just finishing up the work on this. This slide shows you how many wine enthusiast owners we have. We have about 25,000 now. We have about 8,800 wine club members. Now there's some crossover between these two groups, but just think about how remarkable that is. And you can see where they're located around the country. This is a, obviously just a reminder that one of the advantages about this preferred stock is it's, it's listed on the NASDAQ, it trades on the NASDAQ. In fact, you can type in on your phone, Google, WVVIP, that's the NASDAQ trading symbol for this preferred stock. And you can actually put this on your phone and, and see how it's behaving. And I encourage you to do that. So what a fun way to follow your company, easy way to follow your company. You know, we're very strong. Um, you know, when you get in and look at the financials, you'll discover you know, just the level of assets we have in the company, the, the earnings performance we've had over the years. We're a very strong company doesn't mean there aren't risks, right? We know that there are challenges, like we're gonna have lower margins because of the lower yields we received from the 2020 vintage. And because now bottles are cost a lot more right now because of the problems with the uh, supply chain that we're gonna have a couple of years where we're gonna see depressed gross margins. And so the financial performance of the company will not be what it has been until we're able to overcome those challenges and work through them. Uh, but also get all of these other locations open uh, that have been uh, now are being funded. Here's a slide that shows you the stock certificate you'll receive, uh, which will be next year. It'll be the stock certificates will be issued at the end of the year. And of course you get business cards 
um, your first set along with your ownership. Um, and those are always coming really handy uh, uh, in, tell, in spreading the word about Oregon wine. This is just a final image to show you how people enjoy our winery. And that's a big part of uh, motivation. The reason why I spent a little time showing you the numbers is because you know we want you, we know you're you're we don't want you to you know think you're you're wasting your money. You're not. I mean, we, this is a very serious business. I know it's a lot of fun. And we'd love to have you join us as as owners in in this business and growing the value of the business, but also uh, in enjoying your wines. So what I'm going to do now is see what kind of questions that my staff has that I should answer. Hey, Jim. All right. I have a question from Howard, and he is asking if there are plans to obtain additional acreage. Oh, yes. Um, we, we uh, as you know, we're, I think I just explained uh, at the beginning of the presentation about the Jory Claim Vineyard, which is now we purchased that land. We're clearing it from uh, basically an old Christmas tree farm that it basically uh, got too, too mature. the trees got too mature. We're clearing that land now. We'll be planting it this next year and we'll continue to grow our, our plantings. We'd like to be at least 50% owned vineyard relative to our overall production. We do contract on a long-term basis with some excellent growers here in the Willamette Valley. Some of them are smaller and very unique special locations. And then some of them are larger growers. They're very serious professional growers. Um, and so it, we use a combination uh, because the, the, one of the advantages of our, our organization is that we draw wine grapes from different sources within the valley and different places in Oregon. And that's, that helps uh, create some heterogeneousness uh, to our fruit supply because there are weather events that can occur in various places um, in Oregon. And this is kind of a way of, of making sure we're balanced in our food sources. All right, next we have a question from Jim Morse asking if the dividend could be used towards the cost of wine club shipments. The dividend you convert to a wine credit um, can be applied to anything you purchase and you get 15% more value. So if you're owned a dividend of $100, then you get $115 worth of value that you can apply to anything that you buy. So you come to the winery, you buy a burger, you apply it to that. You come to the winery and, and sign up for wine club, apply it to that. So and I, I, we really do encourage you to do that. It's a, it's a great way for you to enjoy your investment. Okay, we also have a question from Andy um, saying the stock is at 679 today. How does that translate if we are only purchasing at 515 per share for preferred stock? Well, we're selling the stock directly. And, and so as a consequence of selling it directly, um, there's a savings obviously to the investor. Um, you know, this stock is, we don't have to have an investment banker help us sell the stock. There's no commissions that are being paid to anyone in, in you acquiring the stock directly from the company. Um, and, and actually Katie, who's on this call is, is one of the staff people who leads the effort in processing these purchases. Uh, so we're very efficient in how we uh, convert capital from our investors into the money we use to grow. And, and, and uh, what's really the market is presently signaling is that the market is valuing that preferred stock at a higher level than what we're selling it for. That's what the market, I believe, is, is signaling. But we do have standards. Uh, you, know, we, you can't buy this stock from us except you have to buy, there's a threshold, a minimum threshold to purchase. And you, you need to qualify as a wine enthusiast before we'll process that subscription. We also have a question from Nicholas asking, where does WVV rank in terms of production when compared to other wineries, Oregon wineries? Well, we're, I would say, one of the larger producers. Now, there are larger producers um, that buy in production volume. You know, we made, I think, around 220,000 cases uh, this harvest, close to that, which is really at our maximum. And so that's why we're having a plan to grow uh, new facilities. The, um, the are, there are larger wineries. There's a winery called Union Wine Company that sells a lot of wine in cans. And there's a company called A to Z 
that sells a lot of wine. These wines are, they're considerably lower in, in the price of the wines that they sell, which might be one of the reasons why their, their volumes are higher. But I would say we're probably third largest behind those two in terms of total volume. Now remember, we focus on selling uh, wines that are predominantly, that are grown within the Willamette Valley AVA. That's our most dominant brand, the Willamette Valley Vineyards uh, brand, which is a 100% Willamette Valley Vineyard or Willamette Valley American Viticultural Area sourced wine. And, and these other producers are Oregon wine producers. So they buy wine grapes from Southern Oregon or from Eastern Oregon, places like that. Um, and we don't do that. Now we do have wines that we make that are very special wines from the Rogue Valley, uh, like Griffin Creek, from the Umpqua Valley American Viticultural Area, uh, which is Paramine, which is a red blend that's Tempranillo based. We also make wines from the Walla Walla AVA, uh, Maison Bleu from the Rocks District. Wow, is that a special place to, to grow grapes where you've got to plant your vines with a crowbar? Um, and then we, we, we make a, a brand called Pambren, which is named after my fifth great um, grandfather and grandmother who were the, um, the leaders of the Hudson's Bay Company at um, the Nez Pierce Trading Post back in the early, early 1800s. Um, and that's predominantly Cabernet Sauvignon focused brand. And then we make a brand called Mati that's in honor of my fifth great grandmother uh, Kitty Pambrin, who was Mati, she was Cree, you know, which is one of the reasons why the Hudson Bay Company had so much success, because the, the indigenous population here in the Northwest trusted the Pambrins um, at the Ms. Pierce Trading Post. And, and so those are just a couple of examples. We also make a brand called Elton in honor of the Elton Vineyard, um, which is a single source um, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So our wines are frankly more limited and, and more expensive, but, but um, so, so it's, so, but, and so I wouldn't say that we're the largest nor would we ever really uh, aspire to be the largest in production. What we wanna do is we wanna make the highest quality wine possible from these special American viticultural areas. Okay, I also had a question earlier from Holly asking what the advantage of being a preferred shareholder is versus a common shareholder. Well, first of all, the advantage is, is that preferred stock is available and, it, and, we're, we're, and that's what we're selling. Um, and so that's the first thing is it's available uh, and you can buy it from the company. Uh, the common stock hasn't been sold by the company uh, since um, 1991. The, the preferred stock is, doesn't have voting rights like the common stock does. But the preferred stock is called preferred because it, it, it comes ahead of common. So if the company is sold, the assets are sold, the preferred stockholders are paid first. That's what that means. The common stockholders take a, a greater risk because they're paid second. Um, the, you know, the, um, the preferred stock has a fixed dividend, which we're obligated to honor. In fact, um, it's 22 cents a share. And uh, you know, nobody, the board of directors can't decide that they're not going to honor that. Now, if there was a time of significant economic stress in our nation or in the world, and our company had difficulty coming up with the cash to pay the dividend. Obviously, we're going to ask our shareholders to take it in wine, which is what we do now. We have 80% of our new preferred shareholders are, are actually agreeing to buy wine with their dividend. The, um, but, but, but even if that doesn't happen, the preferred owner's dividend accrues and is a claim against the assets of the company. So it's... Uh, it's, it's actually quite, in my view, quite a strong investment. And, and I encourage you, those who are financially oriented, and want to take the time, really re request you, you do, is look at the prospectus and, and study our financials and see what we built. We're proud, really, as, um, as employees of Willamette Valley Vineyards. And we're very proud of, of what we've created and the value we've created for our owners and the community. All right, we'll ask one more. 
from Jim Felton, and he's asking, do the dividends used for winery purchase expire if not all used each fiscal year? Well, that's a great question. And no, they don't expire. They don't ever expire. So um, you can hold your, uh, your wine credit on account. And I've, I know people who are actually holding it on account so they are saving them up so that they can use the winery facilities for a big event. You know, some of them have special events that they're planning with their family members. And, and, and so that's, so we have, I do know of those, some of those who are kind of building the kitty uh, of, with their wine credits for a particular purpose. And you're certainly capable of doing that and they don't ever expire. Um, you know, it, uh, I really appreciate you tuning in uh, and listening. It's, uh, I think we've been at this now almost 50 minutes in presentation. For some of you have been on the call for 55 minutes. I greatly appreciate your interest in Willamette Valley Vineyards, your support of the Oregon wine industry. You know, there's a lot of great winemakers in Oregon. I encourage you to go out and, and see them, visit them, and support them. Um, we, our industry has been built by the cooperation and the collaboration between our fellow winemakers and the support of people like you who believe in the future of Oregon wine and tell your friends, your neighbors, and continue to support those wines when you go out to dinner or when you entertain in your homes. So thank you very much for dialing in. I hope I get a chance to meet you in person.